Um, tonight we're doing early paddle options in New Mexico and vicinity. Uh, just real quick, Norm's going to talk about the Gila. Uh, Adam's going to talk about the Canadian River. I'm going to talk about the Mama Chama section up above El Vado. And then we've got some others that we may get to as well. Um, Norm, Adam, you guys draw straws. See who wants to go first. All right. Um, so the Canadian River is not a river that almost anybody has run. There's a few people who have. Uh, I chased it for almost a decade before I ran it. It is a very um, infrequent runnable flow river. Um, and I put this slide in to give you an idea of where it's at. It's in the Kiowa National Grassland, or part of it is runs through the Kiowa National Grassland in northeastern New Mexico. So you go past Las Vegas, out to Wagon Mound, out past Roy. Um, and there's actually like 150 miles of boatable river here. And it, it comes all the way out of Raton, but it drains actually more of the plains area than it does the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Um, at least most of what does come out of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains gets used for, for irrigation most years. So it flows as frequently in the late summer due to monsoons or early fall as it does early season. But when we ran it, finally, it was early season. Although I have seen it runnable a couple of times during monsoons, I wasn't able to get a group together to boat it. It's a three hour drive from Albuquerque to Mills Canyon. And the part that I did that we did was from Mills Canyon to the New Mexico 120 bridge. So this section right here, and that's the public land section and is probably, you know, amongst the nicest um, scenery in the canyon. Although I don't know because I haven't done the rest of it and I'd love to someday. Um, this slide I put in, uh, I don't know if you're seeing my bar there, if you can see it, oh, there we go. Um, Cause it's tricky to find the access. It took me, I didn't realize that this was public at river access until after I ran it. Um, at the takeout, we ran into some rangers who we were afraid were landowners, but um, uh, Uncle Steve was chatting with them when we showed up, so it was nice. So if I can move this out of the way. <laughs> um, as you come in from Wagon Mound to the bridge, you don't want to go down by the bridge. There's really poor access here. There is up on the hill a road. It's marked private property right here, but this whole part is public property. And we confirmed that with the rangers there. And there's a really nice riverfront area there that would be a beautiful picnic if you were just driving through. Beautiful area. I mean, this river is really great. And I'll show you some pictures. Uh, the put in at Mills Canyon, um, you're down 600 feet in a canyon, and it looks a whole lot like um, the Chama in a way. It's similar, it's the same three layers of sandstone. The uh, I can't remember Cretaceous, Jurassic, uh, it's the same three kind of the ones that make the three the white, yellow, and red uh, in the Chama. So you kind of recognize that when you come in. Um, there's nice public camping, um, campsites here. Mills Canyon is a great place to go. It's a little bit over a three hour drive. And the drive from uh, Mills Canyon back to the NM120 bridge is over an hour because you come down a pretty steep road where I would recommend you need high clearance, not necessarily four wheel drive depending on the weather, but you do need high clearance uh, to get down into Mills Canyon. Um, and that's just a beautiful place to camp. I've camped there a few times trying to catch runnable flows in the past before I ran it. Um, and then the scenery is really amazing. Um, you get on the river, it is, it is top-notch scenery. Um, so I put in some pictures. I will kind of scroll through. It's 17 miles from Mills Canyon to New Mexico 120. And that's kind of the shortest section uh, of this river that you can do. If you go below there, you have to go all the way to New Mexico 490, and I can go back to that map, or the 419, sorry. Um, this doesn't look that much farther, but it's it's a greater distance. And I believe there's a pretty nasty class four rapid toward the end of this section as well. Um, the can gets deeper as you go. I have been to this put in and scouted it a little bit. It looks really pretty there. And I'd love to run this section if we could get enough water. Um, so back into the pictures. Uh, one of the really neat things 
there's a couple of really amazing things about this river. One is the miles and miles of essentially sheer rock and or cliff going straight into the river, which I just find to be a treat. It makes for just really pretty paddling. The other thing is it's the, it's the most pool drop river I have ever seen in my life by a lot. The, the pools, even when the current is up, even when the flow is really high, there is no current in the pools. They are, if there's no wind, dead still. When we did it in the springtime, there was most of the time brutal wind. I don't know how I got this picture with the water looking so good that day because it seemed like I was paddling against 20 mile an hour wind the whole time. Um, another interesting feature was the tumbleweeds that were wrapped around the rocks in a lot of the rapids. Um, don't see a whole lot of that. And just beautiful rock formations. If this was, if this river flowed more often, it would be top notch. It would be, it, it is really beautiful when you can catch it. It is absolute treat. Um, that's all I had for pictures. I'm trying to think if there's any, anything that I missed. Does anybody have any questions about the trip or about this section of river? Do it that way. Yeah. So, Go. What flow is it runnable at? Oh, okay. So there's two gauges. I forgot that. There's a gauge up near Springer and there's a gauge down near Sanchez. It says near Sanchez, but it's down here and it says near Sanchez, New Mexico. And those are the only two gauges that are really relevant. And when we ran it, it was saying 165 up near Springer. And I think it was like, I can't remember what it was down near Sanchez. And that was really low flow but it was totally runnable i mean the rapids were decent it, it wasn't drag your boat low flow um and i believe you can run it from what i've read and i've done a lot of research but very few people have done this so it's hard to know what's reliable data um, it, you should be able to run it up to a couple thousand pretty easy um, and maybe even higher it seems like it, it's used to huge flash floods um, so it's got a pretty big channel and this what? was just uh, during the day, just a one day trip, or did you do overnight? I did it as a one day. If I had it to do over, I would absolutely overnight it, especially with the safe parking that I found at the bottom. I wasn't sure that you could leave a vehicle there. Um, so we did all 17 miles in one day and I did it one day. And then Scott came behind me with another crew that did it the next day. And I helped them with their shuttle because it is a long, long day day when it's over three hours to the put in an hour back to the takeout and an hour back to the put in um, to do all your shuttling and everything and then another three hour drive back to albuquerque yeah and the river is it's weird usually there's very little water in the river and along the upper stretch the first 10 miles i would say are beautiful camping and when the river is not flowing people can jeep it and cross crisscross the river and there's really nice developed campsites down there that people use and it's just a beautiful area it'd be worth jeeping as well um, when the when it's not flowing but when it is flowing they can't get their jeeps there so i would i if i go back i'd love to do it for multi-nights um, it's it's beautiful mm -hmm. the trick is getting steady flow that you can trust and not get stranded or flooded there's what, one there's the, uh, the the ratings on the rapids um from mills canyon to the new mexico 120 bridge it, th there was one rapid that i would call a class three and not a difficult one you should be able to pretty easily see it and and um portage it if you feel the need to um, everything else was class two and they're really fun little <clears throat> drops you get this big pool you paddle across the pool and then there's just this fun little drop for you know 100 feet or 100 yards they're they're kind of shallow rocky shoals rapids um you find a channel and bump your way down the one class three rapid uh had some narrow slots and we were all in iks and a couple of hard shells and, and it wasn't any problem to drop through those in a bigger raft i can see it might be a challenge and you might have to portage or drag over a rock here and there for that one class three rapid do you have, um, so I, <laughs> my car is not high clearance and it's so tired of me beating it up. Um, do, did you check out the other access points? Are they not as bad as? 
Um, if you if you don't go into Mills Canyon, you'd either have to go from Springer all the way to the 419 bridge, or maybe the I guess you could go to the 120 bridge to the 419 bridge. I believe there's a class four if you do that section. I've never done it. I, I would love to. Um, and I don't know uh, about access at the 419 bridge and, and where you can leave a vehicle there because I haven't haven't done it yet. But how about the 56 bridge? Um, yeah, uh, there's, there's, it comes right down to the river there. It looked pretty easy to get to the river. It looked like it was some private land and, and it wasn't a really great like drive up to the, to launch your boat access, but um, the paved road goes right across the river there. Okay, one more question. I don't want to monopolize it. The Mills Canyon put in, is that labeled on the road mills canyon or what's yeah if you look it up it's uh it's a campground it's on the kiowa national grassland it's maintained by i'm not sure what agency but it is it's a tourist destination well i mean it, there's there's placards and signs developed campgrounds with pit toilets there's an old ruined mill um that has paths and it, they don't have a ranger down there, but it's it's developed um, and it's well known and you can find it really easy if you search for Mills Canyon or okay. if you just zoom in on that area. Thank you. You bet. It sounds like you could do it in an open canoe if you're good. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yep. Cool. Well, I don't want to I want to give Norm and definitely time for the Gila. There's there's more great rivers to go. So uh, any any last question before I hand it over? Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Hope Good to job, see you Adam. out there. Okay. <laughs> well, I have a bunch of slides here, and I'm um, a lot of pictures, and I'm just going to breeze through and uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, the Gila River Wilderness Run is a just a super magical place. Um, it <clears throat> Traditionally, it runs in the... Um, in the winter, uh, particularly if you can get a, a rain on snowpack event, uh, and sometimes during the, the monsoons. If you go in the winter, I mean, the winter is when you have to go, but one of the tricks is, um, as Adam just said, uh, with regard to the Canadian, it, it, the Gila is a very flashy river, and it's pretty uncommon that you can find the sustained flow my favorite times uh, to run it are um, after a, a peak flow you know, on the declining hydrograph, and you know, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. This actually is, um, is a map that Adam Hill put together. Um, the red, um, so this, this in, in blue, you see the Gila River through the wilderness. The red lines are the wilderness boundary. The put in is up toward the Gila cliff dwellings and the takeout is at the end of a road. Uh, you can actually take out in, in two places. One at uh, what uh, Adam has marked as mile 45, which is at the end of the road. Um, you, you turn off at Cliff, New Mexico and go on the on the north side of the river uh, to the to, to the takeout at, at Muggion Creek. There's a campground there. The other takeout is um, in the Turkey Creek vicinity, right below the wilderness boundary. But if you take out there, number one, you've got to deal with a pretty um, bad road. Definitely requires a high clearance vehicle. I went in there this last fall and it was awful after the monsoons we had. And you miss a beautiful Wild River Canyon um from mile 39 to mile 45 it's 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 a really sweet place so i would recommend taking it out at um at gila now <clears throat> peter koa my friend peter koa uh worked to prepare this slide and it has to do with the flashiness of the river so this is a a, a, a slide that takes the flow the daily flow from every day since 1936, um, every year is a horizontal stripe and the flows are color coded. So where the flows are yellow, um, 
there's not really enough water to have a good time uh, paddling. My cutoff in a canoe was always 350 CFS. I did it a um, couple of years ago in a ducky at 160 and I had a great time. Um, so I guess with climate change and declining river flows, we all need to get used to, um, to boating at other times. But the flows uh, as starting a thousand and above are coated in blue. So every place that there's a blue smear on the um, on this chart, the river was boatable uh, at, at a decent flow, or it was too high to boat. You know, the, this doesn't distinguish. So it gives you an idea that um, if if you if you want to boat the Gila, you've got to be paying attention to the gauges, and you've got to be ready basically to drop what you're doing and, and go. Um, I started running the Gila when I was in my 30s, uh, which is a long time ago, 40 years ago. And I always made it a priority to, um, to take time off, you know, and I had a job where I could do that on short notice. Um, other people may not be as fortunate, but that's the way you get to boat the Gila. This is a hydrograph. Um, for a trip that I took with Robert Sal with three other um, Adobe Whitewater Club members in uh, February of, of 2020, uh, just before the um, uh, COVID hit. And we got on the river, um, I think it was around February 22nd. Uh, the flow came way up and we actually, it was raining, we actually stayed in one place for a couple of days and then we rode the hydrograph out um, at above a thousand and that's that's a great way to be able to do it uh, and i'll just share some pictures now with you of, of the way it looks um, it's volcanic terrain uh, there's all these spires in the in the in the lower parts of the river um, sycamore trees which you don't see very often the camping is just wonderful up on the riparian benches um, big mature alligator junipers, just a really pretty, pretty place. Um, this is my craft of choice, a tandem canoe uh, with a good um, bow paddler. Um, one place off to the side, this, this little bitty seep is running into the Gila River, uh, right below a, a water spout from a, from a spring that pours in. This is uh, a section of the of the boatable river upstream from the takeout at Muggyone Creek, looking back up to the Wild River Canyon that I talked about between the two takeouts. Uh, and this is a tricky little place because levees that were constructed in the 1960s de destabilized the river. Now, the levees were constructed down in the in the Cliff Gila Valley, a little irrig uh, irrigated pastoral valley that's right below this. So when they built those levees, and of course they got washed out immediately, uh, it, it, uh, when they built the levees, they de destabilized the river. And there's a, this is tricky right here because there's a head cut that's actually working its way upstream. It'll get stopped by bedrock. Um, some of my friends like to use pack cats. Um, it's, it's a good craft to use. Um, Boating the river, we were talking earlier about Uncle Steve, um, who's the person on the left, and my friend Todd Schulke, who um, worked so hard with uh, three other people, including me and, and Peter Koa, um, to defeat the Gila Diversion Project. Now, this is a feature of the Gila, where the river comes kind of out of a main channel, and it flows through these grass tufts. And in this particular place, if, if I'm recalling it correctly, there was a river-wide strainer that was immediately downstream of this. And you could get by the strainer um, by getting into this little side channel and then sawing limbs uh, while you were in your boat out of the sycamore that was down across the river and, and then continuing on. It, it's just a gorgeous, beautiful place um sycamore growing out of a cliff there 
If you do go, um, you absolutely need to be prepared for rain, particularly in the in the winter and in the early spring. Um, and you need to be prepared to hole up for a couple of days if the flow goes up while you're you're on the river. I've seen the river um, twice go up with continuous rain and snow just the minute we put on. We had to pull over and hole up, and the first instance. Um, the river literally turned to almost solid wood with the huge trees and stuff coming down. No paddler could have survived being, being out on the river in those conditions. You also really have to watch out what you're doing with those strainers. Um, this raft flipped in uh, a trip in March 2020 uh, because the boatman didn't see the pullout to get around the strainer. He floated into the strainer. His boat went under the strainer, flipped. He climbed out on the strainer, thank goodness. I picked him up and we um, came down to find uh, his boat, sans oars, uh, up, washed up on a gravel bank. This is floating by. This was a sweet picture. It was a, just a moment that I savored so much. This was the first proposed site for the Gila diversion project where they would have taken water out of the river with a diversion dam here and piped it through a, a tunnel cut under the mountain. Um, it was truly a boondoggle project. And this is the picture at the takeout at, at Mugion Creek. Now another section of the Gila that I had not run until 2020 is the low is the the Arizona box and it's in a protected area in Arizona, there are currently uh, controversies about grazing cattle messing up the riparian area, but it is a protected area administered by the BLM. Um, you can uh, find it in guidebooks. Um, this is a picture of the group that went down. Um, and I've blown up so that you can see Mark Allison, who's on this call on the right. He didn't know I was going to be showing his picture. Todd Schulke, um, our senior senator, Senator Heinrich, who was about to, I think, announce a wild and scenic bill is the reason he was there, and a, and a national reporter that came out to make the run through the Gila box with us. Senator Heinrich was going to run the um, wilderness section, but he could only spend one night because he had to get back to Washington for a vote. And um, I'm just going to go over a couple other rivers just really quickly, just to mention the paddle opportunities. And before I talk about the Lower Taos Box, let me just mention that there were maybe five years where my friends and I made it a point to paddle the race course every month of the year for like five years in a row. Um, so early season paddling, get there, get out there on the race course, particularly before um, they start irrigating in, in Colorado, which will cut the flow markedly. Now, the box has always been a favorite run of mine after I acquired the skills to be able to run it. This is a bridge of the put-in, um, John Dunn Bridge, uh, easily accessible. While you're on the Lower Taos box, you pass under the Gorge Bridge. It's always beautiful to see the bridge from, uh, from this perspective. Um, lots of wildlife, um, beautiful scenery. I've always been too busy in the rapids to take a picture of them, but the rapids are um, definitely exciting. Class four, gorgeous, gorgeous river. The Salt River is another uh, favorite along with the Verde. I have a couple of pictures of the salt to show you. Well, let me go back. It's also an early spring run. And if you didn't apply for a permit, um, which pretty iffy uh, this year with the, with the drought, um, you, you've missed the window for a permit. Boating through a granite canyon surrounded by saguaro cactuses is, is just a real treat. Um, these are the waters below the Crux Rapid, um, and I'm drawing a blank on the name of it now. Somebody help me. Um, quartzite. Quartzite. This is after they blew it up. This was a mandatory class five portage 
Um, as you probably know, a river guide and his friends blew it up and did jail time for it. Um, and it's now a very, it's a very tricky uh, rapid to run with um, basically a blind drop. Uh, you can scout at some flows. Right below it, there's this great big pool. Um, and the pool drops into another class four rapid. And I don't remember the name of that one either, but it is a kick. And that's a picture um, in that rapid. And the last section of river I want to mention is the Upper Pecos River from Villanueva State Park to Tecolatito. Um, if you're going from Albuquerque, you go out I-25, and there's a turnoff. Uh, I think it's New Mexico State Road 4 that goes to the state park at Tecolatito. You put in there um, the takeout. Um, did I say Teclatito? You put in at Villanueva State Park, you take out at Teclatito. When my friends and I were running it uh, back when there was good water and we could run it most springs, um, it was a real problem parking uh, cars at the takeout because of vandalism. Uh, but one of my friends um, walked up the road to one of the nearest houses to the bridge um, there was a chain link uh, fence and a chain dog, and um, he went up and knocked on the door and asked the owner if we could pay to park in his yard, and that solved our, our vandalism problem. We also got um, our shuttles some years from the, um, the director of the state park, the manager of the state park there at, at, at Villanueva. So just a, a really special place, and there are other runs on, on the Pecos River as well. So that's um, that's my slides, and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions you may have. And Norm, what uh, what would you consider a maximum flow on the Gila that you would be comfortable running? Two thousand. Yeah, that's what I would think. Yeah. Thanks. I've run it. I've actually run it. One. I was lucky enough one one September that we were on 2000 CFS after a big monsoon for, I think it was three continuous days. It was just a superb opportunity. Um, I've been on it at higher flows before, but the river gets fast. And, um, you know, one of the things about the Gila is there could be a strainer around, a river wide strainer around any corner. You, you know, it's a class two plus river with class three to, to four minus um, sweepers and occasional river wide strainers on blind corners. You've got to be able to eddy out on a moment's notice if you don't know uh, whether or not the river is free of strainers if nobody's been down recently. And I think the last time we were down in March of 2020, there were two river wide strainers that had not been there when we ran the river in February. Norm, that Gila River Lodge, they still do shuttle service or that's an option? No, they do. The Wilderness Lodge is where um, I arrange my shuttles now. Um, the proprietor uh, calls on his friends. They're the ones who keep the, the river. Uh, they saw out the strainers that go down there with saws and stuff. And a lot of times they've been down and, and, it, and it'll be clean, but sometimes not. But I guess the other thing I would say is, um, you know, it was a fine trip at um, at 160 CFS in a self-support ducky. Um, I think we took took us five days to get down it, and there was there was some dragging, but it was it, it it's such a superb place to be that that I would encourage you to do that if you're interested. It's easier to catch than the Canadian. I think it is. Absolutely. My name is Dave Rochelle. I live in southern New Mexico. I go down the Gila quite a bit. I went down in March of 2020 before COVID hit. You probably on the river the same time was out there. I was out there. Uh, the lower box uh, where you put in at uh, Bill Evans Lake and you take out at Highway 460. That's the middle box. You put in at Bill Evans Lake and you take out at New Mexico 464 is a good float. 
if you put in at 464 and you take out at New Mexico Highway 91, it's the lower box in New Mexico, is also a very excellent float with beautiful rock art panels. Um, we went down both of those at around 200 CFS. We, we go down in pack rafts, um, but uh, those are also excellent stretches of the river that not a lot of people get to do, and uh, we should all hook up to go down the river. Um, the other thing that I haven't done yet, but we're looking at doing is uh, the San Francisco um, River from Glenwood to the Arizona border. It's another one that can get, you can get raftable flows in the springtime. Um, anyway, big fan of the Gila. It's the jewel here in Southern New Mexico. And it's so instrumented that, you know, you have to drop everything like Norm said, uh, like surfers. I mean, you got the, the waves coming in, you gotta go, but you can, you can catch it. Uh, pretty regularly, so. Hey, thank you, Dave. Um, glad to glad to hear from you. Uh, and the only thing I would say is I don't think it's the jewel of southern New Mexico. I think it is the jewel of the Southwest. You're right. You're right. Scale it up. You're right. You're right. Um, the lower box is pretty. It's pretty nice. It's it's class. You know, class one river. But the rock art panels in the canyons, you just stop off and you walk down, just it's really spectacular and not a lot of people out there. So do you take out at um, Red Rock ever? We, uh, we, for the lower box, we put in at Red Rock and we take out near Verdon on Highway 91, right before the diversion dam. Um, there's a road that goes back and you take it up, you drive back there and you just park by the diversion. And we've never had anybody mess with our stuff or anything like that, but that is a possibility for vandalism. Well, in Red Rock's private property, um, owned by uh, one of the proponents of the Gila Diversion Project, and I understand if he's there, he doesn't like people taking out. Senator Heinrich mentioned that there was there would be water, uh, sorry, money available to actually try to buy some, some property along the Gila River and make, um, and make proper put-ins and takeouts, uh, legal ones, uh, where they need to be. So we we ought to be working on that too. I love the middle box. I I would call it one of the best sections of river in New Mexico. I think it'd be more popular than a race course if it was accessible. How long are those sections? Are they multi-day? Um, we overnighted the middle box, but you could probably do it in a day if you had your shuttle together. Yeah, we did the lower box in a day. The middle box, yeah, depending on the flow. It would be ideal to stay one night. We just park at the dump. I mean, we obviously, you guys know more about all this than, than I do. We just, there's like a dump near 464. We just park our vehicle there. And no one's ever said anything, but the, the, the takeout and put in there on 464 is not very good. Only, only time I ever did the middle box was uh, more than 40 years ago, but it there was a really dangerous place where it really narrowed down and then there was a log crossways across it. Um, it would really low flow, it was no problem. You could just carry around, but at higher flow, it, it's one to be uh, cautious of. It's, it's solid class three and super remote and in a tight granite canyon, you're not, you're not portaging anything. You, yeah. You know, the metal box reminded me of, um, of the, like it's a miniature of the Salt River Granite Canyon. Yeah. yeah. Norm, also to add on the Pecos, there's some great sections up above the town of Pecos and then from the town of Pecos for 19 miles down to San Ysidro Bridge, but it's pretty sketchy with private landowners and that lower section has, I think, 14 of the hanging PVC cattle fences on it. That can be kind of cumbersome. There's four barbed wire fences through there. Two of them you have to lift up to get under. I, I failed to mention that the, um, the Villanueva State Park, the Tecolotito run, I, I would call it uh, class four minus with one undercut wrap that you really ought to portage. Hmm. Um, undercut wall shot. That, is, is, I would call it a class. I mean, if you messed up, you could die there. But um, it, it, it flows of 700 CFS, which I don't think we've seen in a while. It, it was such a kick. 
It's a long run, a long day, 18 miles. So on to the next presentation, Scott. I'm gonna be talking about the big mama chama and a little bit about the section above that. So the mama chama, we've got this slide up. I'm not very good with computer maps and usually when I share a trip, I send out links for Google Maps, which I'm pretty good at that, but I couldn't figure out how to create and post a map today. And uh, so I, I apologize for that. Um, but the section that that we're talking about is from the Heron Bridge, which is the 95 bridge down into El Vado. And it's 16 plus miles, depending on where you take out. So we'll go to the pictures there. Uh, this picture is actually under the bridge, 95. There's a huge parking lot there, vehicles are safe. We used to put in on the south side of the bridge on the east side of the river. Um, I think there was some signs posted by the landowner there to keep some of the fishermen out so we don't encroach on that anymore. We park in that big lot and we're always in small boats. You can go directly against the bridge or you can walk around a down fence. We've talked to property owners there. And as long as we pick up any trash we find while we're there, he's okay with allowing us to use even his roadway to go around that fence. But they they hate seeing trash. It's mostly from fishermen, but uh, we certainly don't want to give them the impression that it's boaters leaving any kind of trash there. But vehicles are pretty safe there. The uh, shuttle is real quick. It's 13 miles down to the north ramp of El Vado. Uh, but that's the only easy part of this river is driving that shuttle. Uh, <laughs> next slide. This is a one of the fences below the gravel pit. The first obstacle you'll see and and they're in Los Ojos. If you look at Google Maps, you can see a gravel pit. And uh, I know a friend that knows the owner of that gravel pit that might even be able to rework the channel a little bit and make it a little more passable. Uh, at lower waters, it's real rocky, bumpy trying to get through there. And then it runs into bedrock and it makes some great uh, ledge waves that that'll surf you, but it's very shallow. It's kind of like uh, playing on a concrete, you know, ditch feature. Uh, it's very shallow. You can side surf it and stuff, but be careful if you go over. I broke a paddle there one year. Back in 2015 was the first time I ran it. And uh, this fence was there just below the gravel pit. You can see that house on the south side. Uh, that fence was across the river. We had to portage that, obviously. The fence is blown out. Two weeks later, it was gone and they have never replaced it. Uh, but just be aware that there could be a fence pop up there again anytime. Uh, there used to be a big heron rookery, that tree. The eagles took it over. Now the, eagle, the uh, herons are down closer to El Vado Lake up on that south bank, way up in some dead pines. But you see a lot of wildlife. Uh, we've even seen a, a pie-faced pie deer, a doe with white fur on her head and front half. Uh, it was pretty common. In that area for a couple of years, there was a lot of pictures on Facebook around about this piebald deer. It's kind of a neat feature. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's Donna. She's the one moderating. If everybody doesn't know Donna, thank you, Donna, for moderating. <laughs> um, this, this was at a pretty good flow. This is a diversion, and it always, every time I've seen, it has a nice clear channel down the center. The sides can get, the sides do get a little retentive on that on that feature, um, but it's pretty easy to see it coming. But that's the only typical diversion dam that is on this section. Uh, this section usually runs uh, starting early May. They don't open the takeout gate till May 15th, but the better flows are in early May. If it's a good year, they'll last into June. So the water is usually cold and the weather can turn. So you gotta be prepared for anything on this trip. A uh, lot, of, lot of snow on the shadowed side, the north bank of the, or south bank of the river on that north slope. So the water can be very cold. Next slide. <laughs> you always gotta watch for new obstacles. Uh, Steve Mathias and I paddled it one year in, in 2019 and uh, we, 
come across at high water, it was 3,000 that year, which is pretty high for that. And we come across that log there on the left, uh, just above the big Mama Chama rapid, rapid. And it's a, a bunch of rocks there and they tend to catch these big logs that come down from upriver. That same log, I went back in February to look at it. And without the water, um, you can see the river's frozen over. There's still flowing water under the ice, but you can see that log and another one behind it. Uh, those came out later that year. We actually did a low water trip and uh, Cliff Locks was with us and he paddled his cataract underneath that log. So you can see how the water varies from 3000 on the left. And then we ran it, I think it was like 350 at low water and Cliff was in his uh, cataract and still made it underneath that. But you've always got to watch for logs. Uh, and there's some great rock features that make good play features down in there, especially uh, when you pass all the private lands at the upper section, you get into the, the gorge proper and beautiful ponderosa pines. Uh, there's a little bit of camping. You've really got to look at your map and know what property you're on, whether you're on state park land, which could be on the right. Um, there's a lot of private land up above. So you really need to know where you're at there are a couple of dirt vehicle full -wheel drive access roads uh, from the South Bank. And every once in a while, you'll see people down there. Uh, some people even float from the bridge down to that location and take out there. Um, I've never driven the road out. I've walked part of it and it's pretty rough, but it's more fun to just keep paddling on through that. But you've always got to watch for logs. Next slide. This is the Mama Chama Rapid, the namesake rapid. And it, I don't know if you can zoom in, but if you look real close on the left side, you see a, another ponderosa log pinned on the upstream side of that rock. And it goes all the way from the river right bank. And it goes three quarters of the way across. Um, you can't see the log there, but you can see the channel. The typical channel is far left. You see that rock with the logs on it, the driftwood? There you can see the drift log on the left, which is river oh. right. Back up. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. But the typical run is left against that left bank uh, by that rock that has driftwood on it. <laughs> that is probably another pretty high flow. We took a raft down that uh, 14 foot raft and it fit through that slot, but it's a blind slot. You don't know if there's wood in it until you get around. And so we send a small boat down first to, to look at it. And if they have to, they can pull into the willows on the left and, and then backtrack. There's some sieves that go between those two big rocks. Uh, there's also a big flat rock, just uh, this side of that pyramid shaped rock. And it's underwater at this level. So that, that rapid is very interesting. You can pull over on river right to scout it. Just above it though, there, there's some significant rocks, but this is the crux rapid. The, the biggest move to make is, is in that rapid. That's Mama Chama rapid. So uh, question, Scott, can you portage yes. that rapid? Yeah, you can portage it on the right. Uh, my nine-year-old son at a high level, I took my boat down then, and then I went back and, and slid down a grassy bank with him in the boat. It was enough water to wash us over that grassy bank on far right. Uh, the ground is such and the current's not as strong on that far river right, which is the left side of the screen. This is looking back up. And that's that's where you would portage around it. But you just don't want to go between the two big rocks or get stuck in any wood that's in there. After that rapid, you can kind of relax, except for that feature. Back up one slide. This one just came about this last year and uh, one of our, our members noticed this strange feature. They can, you can see it from the Heron Dam. If you look down, they had some other pictures. I wish I had time to include those, but from the dam, the road up on top, you can look down at the stilling pond and see this. And what they're doing is they're replacing the old suspension fisherman's bridge, which is getting pretty rickety. And the stairs that go down the bluff about a 30, 40 foot bluff 
there's a spiral kind of wooden staircase and it's been broken for three years probably and there's been no money to fix it. So they're gonna bypass that trail, that route completely and have people walk down the access road to the dam, to the base of the dam from the parking area up above. And then they're gonna put a new trestle bridge and this temporary feature was put there just so they could get equipment on the other side of the river to put up the pedestal for the trestle on the other side, which will probably be just on the upstream side of that, uh, that dirt. And then they hope to have all that dirt and, and culverts removed by March 1st. So they've got a little less than a month. We'll see if they get it complete. If you're driving around Heron and you drive over the dam and look down in the river, take a picture and let me know, let us know how they're progressing with that new bridge construction. But we do expect this to be gone. It kind of caught us off guard. We had to scramble and ask a lot of questions of a lot of people, but uh, we got access to their permits and their design. And the new bridge is supposed to be about 12 feet above the river. So clearance underneath it shouldn't be a problem. But next time you go down, you're gonna be surprised to see this big metal steel bridge over your head. And that, that earthen feature is right at the stilling pond where you used to pull in for a break. This picture is looking at the takeout from the top of the notch, which is the typical takeout. Um, you come around, it's a left-hand corner that heads south into where the lake used to be. You used to, when the lake is high, we would paddle for half an hour in flat water before we even got to that notch. And the notch is an old road or trail that they've cut through the sandstone rim rock. And it's a very prominent sandstone feature when you're on the river. It makes that sharp left. That's where the buoy used to be to indicate the end of the lake, shallows upstream, beware. Uh, but there's a real steep muddy bank there now. Access is pretty difficult there. Uh, it's gonna be like that until they get the construction done on the dam and uh, we get some more water back in that lake. But you can see in the distance there, uh, a tributary, that creek, and then that concrete boat ramp, that's the Elvato North boat ramp. And I've never been able to take a boat out at that ramp. I've never seen the lake that high. But usually we can park a vehicle at the top of that if it's after May 15th. Well, this river runs earlier than that. So you end up having to call the rangers and ask them if they'll please unlock the gate for you that day. And uh, then you can take your vehicles to that. If the gate is locked, it's about a quarter mile from the top of that concrete ramp down a flat dirt road back to the white gate, which is uh, about a quarter mile from the highway. But you can at least park your vehicles at that lock gate and carry stuff out. But the takeout on the Mama Chama is where you really earn your trip. If you don't utilize the notch and you go around the corner, then you've got to climb up a, a heavy silt bank um, you can paddle a little ways across the lake and carry up a steep bank uh, to a parking area there, the road that used to go out on the peninsula. Uh, just don't do it during COVID when the park's closed and don't park off road or you can get an $80 citation. Um, one trip we even paddled all the way down the lake to the main marina on the east side of the lake. And that added probably 45 minutes to an hour, uh, but it was a pretty tough paddle after a long day. And some people were cussing it and it almost got dark on us and we were all cold that day. So there's different options for takeout depending on your craft and, and how you're feeling. And the shuttle to go to the main marina is uh, considerably longer than to do the 13 mile shuttle to this main boat ramp. Small boats are key. Um, I have caught it at levels where we can back a trailer down a dirt ramp, just a half mile from this concrete ramp closer to the lake. And we were able to load a 14 foot raft right onto a trailer, but that was a rare treat. So small boats are best anyway in the Mama Chama. Uh, you can overnight it, there's some nice camps. Um, just got to watch out for private land at the top. We did encounter one new fence that we had never seen before on our last run last year. And uh, 
it was pretty easy to get under the left side. The current wasn't too swift, but it was a shock to encounter another barbed wire fence across one of our favorite rivers. So you've always got to be aware of that stuff. There's a couple of places where there's some T-bar fence posts that have eroded and are in the channel. Um, depending on the flow, they're pretty easy to see and they're not usually in an area that you'd be in anyway. But uh, it's a great river. It's one of my favorites. It's beautiful. It is an early spring run, so weather can, can kick your butt. Uh, we got hailed on one time. Uh, we've had snow. Uh, it's about a, depending on the flow, we've done it anywhere from three hours for the whole thing to six hours. So it just depends on the flow and, and your group, what kind of boats and craft you're with, how often you stop and scout or stop and play or stop to warm up. Uh, but it is one of my favorite rivers. It's called the Mama Chama. So if anybody's interested, I usually post a, a club trip. Uh, I posted on AWC chat and put out an open invite last time. I think we had 14 people and we ended up having to split into two groups, but I met some great people from, from Los Alamos and Santa Fe on some of these trips and even some locals. Uh, I don't know if Henry and C Cicely are on, on the call tonight, but they're locals up there. And uh, I did a trip with them one time and had a great time. That's about all I've got. I apologize for not creating a map. Um, oh, one thing I can mention, we were scouting out the section above this from the town of Chama down to the 95 bridge. That's a long run. I think it's like 19 miles. Steve Harris and Susie and I did that in inflatable kayaks. And we had four portages that we had to make. One was Dan Perry's cable. Um, Coming out of Dan Perry's property, the cable was up high, so that was no issue. There's a fisherman access right there that they were recently putting fences in, new fencing up above on the bank, not in the river. So I haven't been back to check that out, but there is a diversion there that we had to portage on the right. Uh, it's evident, you can see some old bridge pilings, concrete, and they've removed the steel bridge, but those pilings are still there and it's a good landmark for that. And that's pretty much a mandatory portage on river right. Um, downstream, we found two more fences that were made of uh, cowboy rope with wooden poles, but they were in the water, perfect to catch any kind of boater. Um, we had the portage around those. One was a hundred yard carry. Another one was climbing over a fence. Those were for containing horses and cattle on that private area just below Dan Perry's property. And then there was one other fence that we found across the river. Uh, there's a low bridge down in that section that's been developed. There's some nice play features too that, that they've put in for uh, erosion control. And one is a diversion. Uh, that's fun class two, class three stuff, but it's all private land in there. So, you're really under watchful eye if you're in there and some places might holler at you. Uh, the shuttle is pretty easy, access is easy, um, but scout it out and watch for wire across the river and rope fences especially because a couple of them are in real swift current. But uh, that's the upper section. There's a section further up above beyond that, but very few people have run that canyon up there and, and it's all on private land. and uh, that's that's a whole nother story up there and probably not a level for, for this audience. I've not run that and I know only one person that has run it. Um, next slide, I think we're looking for the slide, Donna, that Doug Scott Murphy created. Oh, here's a good view that Steve and I took of the sediment banks. Everything you see there used to be underwater. That Well, not the tree line, but that ridge is lake sediment and that ridge used to be underwater that's part of el vado and the the sediment there was cavity the near water. ridge not the far ridge right yeah the dirt ridge not the green ridge the green ridge was not underwater in our lifetime but that's the upper part of of uh, el vado lake i wish i had another picture this is right down at the water it's kind of deceiving it looks easy um that's 
20 foot bank down to the water and then it's a 200 yard carry across the mud flats back to the truck and depending on weather it could be mud or it could be dry so that's why we paddled on out to the lake last time this picture here and we'll have to share this on our website uh, one of the locals Cicely Fron gave me this pamphlet uh, it was written by Doug Scott Murphy way back in the day and he talks about really low levels and there's some great detail in these and and we'll have to create a file and share it in its own post because it's a work of art you can tell by some of the old boats and the equipment and the gear how old this thing is yeah that's awesome yeah it was a treasure she handed me that and i couldn't believe it yeah, I love this section of river. It's doable every year. I'll absolutely do it this year, and so will a bunch of us. Um, yeah. If I can add a couple of things. Sure. Adam's um, probably run it more often than I have, actually. Yeah, well, I, I love this. section. It's beautiful, and it's not that far, and it runs every year. It's totally doable it, for different durations, depending on the year. Um. The Mama Chama is definitely the worst rapid at most flows, but when it gets to be around 2000, there is near the end of the run, almost to the lake, <laughs> about a mile past the bridge, a horrible class four um, suck hole, ledge hole that will flip you and drown you if you don't have your shit together. And I'm not kidding. There's been multiple bad swims there, including my wife. She had had swift water rescue and that's why she was okay. I couldn't have done anything had she not known how to swim properly to get out of that hole. Cause it was a suck hole. She was going to get circed until she died. And so be careful of that. That's the worst feature. It opens up at about 2000. Normally. I mean, it is so much more violent than anything else that happens on that whole stretch. So can you show us where it is on this? on this map oh on that map um yeah actually it's somewhere at the very far left because it's coming downstream from right to left uh -huh. it's past the it's past the dam and the confluence of where um willow creek comes in out of heron lake it's and real close to the high water mark of the lake you can see the high water mark it's real close to that yeah, I mean, you think you're out of it. You think it's over, so, and so everything's like at thirteen. At this thirteen circle with thirteen. Past that, I think it's past that. Fourteen. Yeah, yeah, I think it's around there, and it's a horizon <laughs> line that, if you're not really adept, if you don't really know how to read water, you don't see that horizon line. I didn't notice it. I saw it. I panicked when I saw it. I was like, "Holy!" And I looked over and my wife was headed right into it. And I hit the bank instantly and got out and got my throw bag. But on the, you know, it was bad. Like it was such a horrible place to swim. And it is. And so anyway, so there, and it's such a higher level feature than anything else that develops on this whole stretch. So I wanted to mention that just, you know, so people, but that doesn't happen below, uh, below 2000. It's not there. There's nothing there. So that's pretty easy that yeah getting out of there is brutal i spend i i i just expect to be pelted with hail such that i have to paddle backwards for part <laughs> of it so have gear for serious like you're not almost never is this running when you don't need a dry suit type level gear you know it, something close to that um so be careful it's easy to run but it's easy to go out there and, and it's nice and warm and beautiful when you put on but by the time you take out it's not and you might be scrambling up a steep mud bank like i've had a hard time crawling out of there a couple of times um so you never know what you're going to get at the takeout so it's 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 for serious and it's it's 14 miles it usually it flows good um so you can do it in a day, but plan on, you know, get on it on time. Don't start late and plan on a good day. And the camping down there is phenomenal. I never do it in a day if I can avoid it. I love overnighting it 
gorgeous camping. You have to go six or eight miles before the camping starts, and then it's beautiful. Have you done any fishing down there, Adam? Yeah, I have. Um, and I haven't, the, when it's flowing uh, for rafting, the fishing's not so great. Yeah. Uh, and most of the camps that I camp at, it's really, they're very overgrown, like uh, along the river, because they're not used. And when the river is flowing like that, in order to get into your camp, you'd have to rappel down the bank or take a boat or, or back down a cliff, because you're on these sandbars, it, it gets deep into that canyon. And yeah, you've got the place to yourself. And it's funny, because there was a wonderful year where it was still flowing through Memorial Day weekend. And I took my Puma, I put my IK on my Puma and my friend took his IK. We packed a bunch of stuff on my raft um, and set up an awesome camp. And we just kept doing day runs where we'd go to the takeout, drive to our shuttle and then come back. Anyway, up by the lakes, it's a freaking zoo with everybody's families and, and people yeah. walking everywhere. And it's just overrun with people. And down in that river canyon, not a soul. And yeah. nobody could get to you if they wanted to. It's it was so awesome. It was beautiful. If it's if it's running Memorial Day, and don't worry about crowd me because there are probably twenty awesome camps in that last seven miles. Like anywhere you want to camp, beautiful. I'm anxious to see what they how they develop that trail down below the spillway dam. Uh, that trail is to connect. The two state parks, Heron and, and El Vado, there's a, already a trail, but they're going to replace that Fisherman's Bridge. If they were to put a vehicle access parking down at the bottom of that spillway, this run would become so popular and so overrun both directions as a put in and take out from that dam area that uh, it would change the character a lot. Scott, I asked um, somebody at the Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation, they said, no, they were not going to put vehicle access there. Right. At one time, they they would cite people or discourage people from walking that access road. But if that's part of their trail system, at least we'll have the opportunity to carry boats out. It'd be a long uphill carry, but that would be an option. Yeah, I've had worse getting out of there. I've been so covered in mud and cold. <laughs> yeah, that that silt, uh, that's a different type of mud. It's kind of a hidden gem up there, the Mama Chama, um, kind of like the Conejos up in southern Colorado. I haven't run it yet, and, and that's an elusive river with a lot of private access issues. So I'd like to get on that sometime. I really enjoyed this evening hearing about some of these other rivers and hearing other people's stories about them, and I hope to get to paddle more of them this year. But thanks again to everybody for joining. Thanks to... Yeah, thanks to Norm for his wonderful information. He's always expert on this stuff. And, and Adam, uh, Adam loves doing these remote rivers. And he's the one that got me on the Chama and got me interested in the Canadian. And um, he's a great, great guy to paddle with. So thanks to everybody for everything you do.